Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Victor Emanuel Nature Tours webinar. I'm Ben Reynolds, host and organizer of today's presentation. We are delighted to offer this educational presentation about sparrows and vent tours. We hope you enjoy today's topic on spots and streaks, identifying song, fox, and savanna sparrows, whatever that means, with Rick Wright. During the session, all attendees may ask questions, but please note that questions will be answered at the end of the presentation. However, if you have technical questions during this session, I will try my best to answer them in real time to help you have the best viewing experience. This webinar is being recorded and will be available to view on demand anytime at your convenience. A link to the recording will be delivered to you in an email in the next few days. Now, back to our feature presentation. Rick Wright is a widely published author and sought after lecturer and field trip leader. A native of Southeast Nebraska, Rick studied French, German, philosophy, and life sciences at the University of Nebraska before taking a detour to Harvard Law School. He took the PhD in German languages and literatures at Princeton University in 1990, then spent a dozen years as an academic holding successive appointments as assistant professor of German at the University of Illinois, reader in art and archeology span at Princeton University, and associate professor of medieval studies at Fordham University. Rick has been leading vent tours for six years that combine birds, nature, and culture. His numerous scholarly publications include two books of the Latin animal literature of the latter Middle Ages. Among Rick's recent books are the ABA Field Guide to Birds of New Jersey and the ABA Field Guide to the Birds of Arizona. His Peterson Reference Guide to American Sparrows was published in 2019. He is also the co-author with Sanford Sorkin of Watching Birds in Montclair and Watching Birds in the New Jersey Meadowlands. Especially interested in the history and culture of birding, he is hard at work on a study of hummingbird collecting in France from the 16th to the 19th centuries. In his spare time, he teaches Latin courses online for the Padilla Institute. Rick lives with his wife, Allison Berenger, and Avril Huang in northern New Jersey, where he offers private birding tours to the marshes, woodlands, and ocean beaches. We are thrilled to have Rick present about three of the commonest sparrows in North America song, fox, and savanna sparrows. We hope you enjoy the webinar. Without further ado, we will turn to Rick's presentation. Thank you, Ben. I'm very happy to see everyone this afternoon. Hard as it may be to believe, even some birders dismiss sparrows as simply brown, streaky blobs, hardly worth looking at. Some are brown, some are streaky. And yes, some are indeed blobbish. But they're all worth looking at. Um, now, that somewhat less than scientifically defined group, the brown, the streaky, the blobbish, includes some of our commonest and most widespread sparrow species. And those species in turn provide some of the brightest illustrations of the challenges that we face in bird identification and illustrations of some of the truly intractable problems in classification and nomenclature. The song, fox, and savanna sparrows are not the only streak-breasted sparrows that we encounter in North America. The adult sharp-tailed sparrows, the salt marsh and Nelson sparrows, and the Baird sparrow are streaked below, and the majority of juvenile plumages across the entire sparrow family feature streaks and spots on the breast. But the song, the fox, and the savanna sparrows, along with their closest relatives, are the classics. And most of us see hundreds of birds of these species to any one of those other species. Over much of the US and Canada, the most abundant of these streaky sparrows is the song sparrow. Singing birds are easily recognized. In June of 1856, Thoreau was told by the residents of New Bedford, Massachusetts, 
that the species sings, maids, 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 put on your tea kettle, edel, edel. And that remains as useful a mnemonic as any for this cheerful series of stuttering whistles and buzzy trills. Along with the usual sparrow lisps, song sparrows also have a very distinctive call note, a nervous husky shep, shep. And that is the source of the name shepherd used by early English speaking colonizers in North America. Visually, song sparrows can be less straightforward, especially when we're in search of something else when even the most familiar bird can start to look odd, and we begin to notice details and variations that the cursory glance might never take in. One of those something else's that we might be looking for is this bird, the Vesper Sparrow. Once a common breeder across most of Southern Canada and the Northern half of the United States, the Vesper Sparrow remains fairly common in grasslands and agricultural landscapes west of the Mississippi. In much of the East though, it has declined to the point that this is now a species of particular conservation concern in quite a few jurisdictions. That sounds dire, but in many areas, it may simply be a return to the status quo before European settlement, when the extensive open habitats the Vesper Sparrow requires were scarce and transitory in the East, the birds were too. Urbanization, suburbanization, and the reforestation of what 300 years ago was cultivated land have all reduced the habitat for open country birds. Wild turkeys, pileated woodpeckers, red-eyed vireos have profited, but there just isn't that much space left for breeding horned larks, bobolinks, and vesper sparrows in much of the East. I noticed the difference on those occasions when I managed to be afield with relatively new birders, those of my companions who grew up in the West, where the Vesper Sparrow is still common, recognize it without hesitation. Those of us who grew up in the now largely Vesper deprived East sometimes find it more of a challenge. It's not a challenge, of course, when the classic field marks are seen, the chestnut lesser coverts of the wing, the white tail edges, but that wing patch is not reliably visible. And by the time the bird shows its outer tail feathers, it's usually over the fence and into the next pasture, and we've missed our chance. Fortunately, there are other less well-known characters that can help us learn to identify the Vesper Sparrow, even in a view that doesn't exactly match the bird on the field guide plate. Almost 90 years ago, Roger Torrey Peterson described this species as a buffy song sparrow a description that has probably misled more birders than it has enlightened. Vesper sparrows would look much less like song sparrows to most of us if the master hadn't warned us that they were so similar. Let's look at the differences. Not all streaked sparrows are streaked the same way. With some exceptions that we'll be looking at a bit later on, song sparrows tend to be boldly marked above and below the brown or chestnut brown upper parts are evenly regularly streaked black and brown and chestnut and the chocolate or black streaking of the underparts stands out clearly against the breast and belly the head of most song sparrows is equally well patterned deep dove gray providing the background for a well-defined pattern of broad stripes the throat pattern is especially striking. Even on sparsely or obscurely marked song sparrows, such are found in the southwest and the far northwest, the throat is bordered on each side by strong lateral stripes, or better, lateral wedges, broad and sturdy at the bottom, which then taper to meet the base of the bill as finer streaks. So the visually heaviest, most coarsely, most boldly marked part of the bird is where the bases of those wedges meet the upper breast. Song sparrows always seem to me to be leaning slightly forward in anticipation of that next juicy bit of millet. Vesper sparrows are different. Observers may note some regional variation in plumage, though there's not nearly as much as in the song sparrows. On average, Vesper sparrows in the West are paler, grayer, and colder in tone than Eastern birds which tend, again, on average, to be darker and browner. More important than that overall color, though, is the decidedly muted contrast between the Vesper Sparrow's upper parts and its underparts. 
the streaks of the back are comparatively inconspicuous against the ground color, and they're blurrier and less regularly distributed than on most song sparrows. Similarly, the streaks of the underparts are less boldly black and less neatly aligned than in song sparrows. And the ground color of the underparts can be a weird, very pale, buffy, tan, yellowish. The streaks may or may not clump at the center of the breast to form a small ragged blotch. Now the presence or absence of a breast spot or a stick pin as the old books call them is notoriously unreliable in identifying sparrows. But in some Vesper sparrows, one distinctive clue is that when such a spot does appear, it's often placed asymmetrically, not in the very center of the breast, but offset higher or lower, left or right. This too contributes to the strange half-finished impression made by Vesper sparrows. The Vesper sparrow is one of a few species of sparrow in which the head pattern can provide a real identification clincher. The white eye ring, conspicuous in some individuals and less so in others, is justly well known. But there's more going on here, especially on the side of the head. The cheek, that is to say the auriculars, the ear coverts of the Vesper sparrow is complexly and uniquely patterned with a roughly triangular sandy brown patch, similar in tone and shade to the upper parts, surrounded by a somewhat irregular blackish border. That border is heaviest and darkest at the bottom, forming what we can call a whisper stripe, dividing the ear coverts from the whitish jaw stripe. That jaw stripe then continues in a broad lavish curve behind the ear. The result is a complicated pattern made up of several small, even tiny marks. There's a pale patch in the center of the ear coverts merging into the crown at the top, but broadly and definitively edged below and towards the rear in black. The ear patch seems to escape at the top, but to be held in bounds below. In many birds, that partial rear border is so much reduced as to be simply a spot at the lower back corner of the auriculars. These individual components of the Vesper Sparrow's pattern are none of them more than a millimeter wide. And taken singly, they are essentially invisible to the observer in the field. But viewed as a whole, as making up a pattern, they give the Vesper Sparrow a distinctive look even at some distance. The bird seems jowly, with heavy cheeks drooping down the side of the head. If the typical song sparrow seems to be leaning forward, to me, the typical vesper sparrow appears to have hunched its neck into its shoulders in disbelief, a posture of astonishment emphasized by the staring white eye ring. Now, let me acknowledge that descriptions like eager, astonished, jowly are entirely idiosyncratic. They make sense to me, but they may make no sense to you at all. And that's all right. My point is illustrative. Coming up with your own private vocabulary to describe a bird, the more outlandish perhaps the better, is one of the very best ways to get to know the bird. Let's step back from the fine details, the feather fondling, to take a broader view of the problem of song versus vesper sparrows. I often tell birders to stop, to start at the rear end, not the head, when confronted with a new or unfamiliar bird. In our case, the long, rather narrow tail of a song sparrow is quite unlike the slightly shorter, rather broad tail of a vesper sparrow. Combined with the smaller, darker bill, most song sparrows on the ground look a bit like feathered ping pong balls with a tail stuck on. Vesper sparrows with their heavier, paler bills are more substantial and they're more evenly tapered. The tail is visually continuous with the flat back and the blocky head. The chief confusion species for both the song sparrow and the vesper sparrow is another common bird, the savanna sparrow. The names demonstrate just how widespread this bird is. The English name refers to the city in Georgia, but the scientific epithet sandwichensis commemorates the type locality, Sandwich Sound in Alaska. Unsurprisingly, the savanna sparrows with this vast range exhibit considerable geographic variation 
We'll look at that a bit later, but for now, let's concentrate on what most of us think of as the classic savanna, found across most of North America, breeding south to Guatemala. These birds, classic savanna sparrows, are distinctly smaller, shorter tailed, and finer billed than songs or vespers, making them readily identifiable even when the traditional field marks aren't visible, namely the clearly defined white central crown stripe and the yellow patch or line between the eye and the bill. That yellow lore is extremely variable. In many individuals, barely a trace of color is discernible, while in others, the entire face can be yellow or greenish, leading inevitably to confusion with the much rarer and more secretive Henslow sparrow. Those field marks are well known, but there are other plumage features that can help identify a poorly seen or distant savanna sparrow. The upper parts of song and vesper sparrows are brown with blacker streaks. In the widespread classic savanna sparrow, the back also features broad conspicuous stripes of white or bright gray. This is often the first character I notice when I run across a savanna sparrow feeding in the grass with song sparrows. From the side, when the back stripes may be less conspicuous, a variably bright chestnut wing panel formed by the secondaries can be helpful too. The underparts are streaked, of course, but they differ noticeably from the song and vesper sparrows in the bright white ground color and fine, sparse, often very black streaks. The center of the belly is pure white. Many, perhaps even most, savanna sparrows show a spot on the breast, usually small and perfectly centered. Savanna sparrows of this classic kind always look neat. As I've hinted at a couple of times, the colors and shape of a bird's soft parts, the bill and the feet, can be useful in sparrow identification. The savanna sparrow, the classic savanna sparrow, is easily distinguished from song and vesper sparrows by its tiny sharp bill. At some angles, in some birds, it can seem almost warbler-like. The bill is pale, often bright pink yellow at the base, unlike the blackish bills of song sparrows and the dull matte gray pink of the vesper. The savannah's feet, the tarsus and toes can be shockingly bright reddish pink, especially in strong sunlight. Savannah sparrows can often be picked out at highway speeds on that character alone. As in all birding, a little knowledge of habitat and habitat prefer preferences is extremely helpful in creating the birder's expectations. We've all seen birds wildly out of their typical habitat, a least bittern on a downtown sidewalk, a grasshopper sparrow in a beachside plum thicket. But in general, a quick look at a familiar habitat type tells us what we should be looking for. A lush grassland in the summertime is home to savanna sparrows, a cornfield edge to vesper sparrows. In winter, both species mingle in dry, sparsely vegetated habitats. At all seasons, though, song sparrows are far more likely to be encountered in wet localities and wooded sites. Flush a song sparrow and it will fly down into a dark, damp thicket. Flush a savanna or a vesper and it will dart up to perch atop a tall grass stem or isolated small tree. The chance to learn little tricks like this is why we always keep watching a bird in the field even after we've identified it. At this point, you'll notice that I've been describing plumages as typical, classic. Let's pause to consider just how that word has come to mean what it does in American birding. Our birding has roots nearly as old as the European settlement of the country, but in the way we think of birding today, our hobby can be traced to the early 20th century when certain field practices, most signally a nearly exclusive focus on identification, were codified by the leading birdmen of the day. I say quite intentionally birdmen. In the West, women such as Martha Maxwell here and Harriet Myers were respected, even celebrated, at that time, but in the East, the bird watching authorities were male. Frank Chapman here, Whitmer Stone, Ralph Hoffman, Ludlow Griscom, the younger generation that included Roger Torrey Peterson. And all these men were sons of the Northeast, New England, New York, the Mid Atlantic. 
and their trend-setting, best-selling, bulldozing books were published in Boston. It's no wonder that song sparrows and eastern towhees and Carolina wrens are all still said to imbibe the Brahmin's favorite hot beverage. And it's no wonder that the classic song sparrow, the typical savanna sparrow, and the standard fox sparrow are the kinds that you can see in the pastures, fields, woodlands, and dooryards of New England. It's nonsense, of course, but birding is as historically and culturally, culturally contingent as any other human activity. In the specific case of our sparrows, the geographic bias of our hobby's early days lingered for long decades, such that we still think of the sparrows of the West as accidental variants of an Eastern platonic ideal, a type. And that, I would argue, led to birders paying less attention to these Western birds than they should. And it led to, I think, to scientific ornithology's modern reluctance to recognize some of them as more than mere subspecies. Let's come back to Earth, though, and back to concrete examples of how our streak sparrows vary over their geographic ranges. The song sparrows are among the most widespread birds in the Americas, breeding from one edge of the Nearctic to the other from the outermost Aleutians to the volcanic belt of Southern Mexico. Like most sparrows, most song sparrow populations are only short distance migrants. And that reduces the amount of wintertime mixing of birds from different regions. And it increases the chances that local variations in appearance will become fixed within a population. It's no surprise then that dozens of subspecies populations marked by geographically consistent morphological variation have been described in the song sparrow. Many of these were in fact originally described as distinct species. Even as late as the second edition of the AOU checklist, the song sparrow was still split into three. Nowadays, as far as I know, there's no serious move afoot to, to re-split these species, but that does not change the fact that the different flavors of song sparrow are often identifiable in the field, and that picking them out can add considerably to the pleasure of a morning sparrow watching. For convenience and communication, in the Peterson reference guide, we divided the various subspecies into groups, chocolate sparrows, sooty song sparrows, rusty song sparrows, and olive song sparrows. The chocolate birds, include the medium-sized, medium-billed breeding birds of the east, the boreal forest, and the western mountains. These are what the older books call the typical song sparrow. It also includes three relatively little known subspecies of central and southern Mexico. Even within this group, the chocolate song sparrows, not all individuals look exactly alike. Here in northern New Jersey, where all of our song sparrows belong to this group, it's easy on any given day, especially in winter, to run across pale birds and dark birds, gray birds and reddish birds, heavily streaked birds and sparsely marked birds, big ones and little ones. Some of this variation is geographic. We have two subspecies that overlap here in winter. Some of it is age related and some of it is purely individual. The other particularly widespread group is the rusty song sparrows found in the west, in the southwest. There's a great range of variation in the subspecies belonging to this group, chiefly in the darkness of the rusty tone plumage. Most familiar to most birders are probably the rusty song sparrows of the Pacific Northwest. In coastal British Columbia, Washington, and Oregon, these birds can be remarkably dark above and below a rich chestnut so deep as to virtually obscure the markings of the upper parts. The streaks of the breast and flanks are equally dark, broad, and diffuse. They often clump to form a vague band across the breast rather than a spot, and they broaden on the flanks into a dark reddish patch, similar in color to the back and wings. Farther inland, these rusty song sparrows may be less reddish, they smoothly integrate in color to neighboring populations of chocolate song sparrows. 
The Southwestern representatives of the song sparrow, though, are quite different from any chocolate song sparrow, and they're noticeably unlike their more northerly counterparts in the Russi group. They're pale reddish and dove gray with sparse, fine, reddish streaks on a white breast and a gray back. The birds of southern Arizona's desert wetlands were originally described as a new species, phallax, meaning tricky. And tricky they are indeed. I've spent untold hours of my life trying and often failing to convince first-time visitors to southeast Arizona that these are in fact just song sparrows. It doesn't help that the pale southwestern birds are more likely than other song sparrows to cock their long tails over their backs, wren-like, or to walk rather than hop. The olive song sparrows make up what is probably the most interesting group from the point of view of avian evolution. While the entire eastern half of North America gets by with only two subspecies, both of them in the chocolate group, California and its islands are occupied by no fewer than seven song sparrow subspecies, three of them in the marshes of San Francisco Bay alone. Each of these olive birds occupies a dangerously small range, and one of them, formerly resident throughout the Channel Islands, is now extinct on at least San Clemente and Santa Barbara Islands. These California specialties are the smallest of the song sparrows. They're faintly olive tinged above and quite white below with notably sharp, distinct black streaks. One sp subspecies has a face sometimes as yellowish as the most yellow of savanna sparrows, while there is also a very long billed race heavily marked with black on the side of the head. As in the other song sparrow groups, the more inland subspecies gradually merge in appearance with neighboring populations of chocolate and rusty song sparrows. Central California's Harriman song sparrow, for example, is faintly clouded olive above, but the wings and back markings are quite reddish. The underparts are duller white, and the breast streaks are dull rusty and somewhat blurry. Visually, this bird here shows a, a, a place between the rusty song sparrows to its north and the chocolate song sparrows to its east. The northwesternmost of the song sparrows are the sooties. These are large to very large birds with large to extraordinarily huge bills. Their overall color ranges from gray-brown to gray to somber dark gray. The streaking of the underparts can be poorly defined, smudgy against a dull ground color. The biggest, darkest subspecies are resident on islands in the Bering Sea, while others breeding in Alaska and northern British Columbia winter in small numbers on the coast south to Washington, Oregon, and northern California. West Coast birders have no trouble allocating one of these bruisers to the sooty group, but distinguishing them further to the subspecies level is challenging. If species splits are unlikely among the song sparrows, they're badly overdue among the savanna sparrows. The American Ornithological Society still recognizes only a single species. But as traveling birders know, some are so utterly distinctive as to differ more from the standard run-of-the-mill savanna than they seem to from some other sparrows. And phylogenetic studies confirm it. Divergence within the savanna sparrows is quite great enough to justify recognizing a number of distinct species within the complex. Here on the East Coast, our special savanna is the Ipswich Sparrow, a large pale wraith breeding on a single Nova Scotia island and wintering in beach dunes south to Virginia. Its frosty overall appearance, slightly swollen bill, and cinnamon edged breast streaks make it distinctive in the field. Even so, genetic studies suggest that this bird, the Ipswich Sparrow, is probably still best treated as a subspecies of the savanna. It's quite different in the West. The dark, crisply streaked belding sparrow of Southern California and the Baja Peninsula is recognized by pretty much every authority but the AOS as a separate species. This is a salt marsh specialty found only out on the Salicornia Flats, where family groups and small flocks gather to perch upright on long, sturdy feet. With their spike-like bills and streaky blackish plumage, they can bring to mind tiny red-winged blackbirds scattered across a marsh. 
Building sparrows are darkest and smallest at the northern edge of the species range in California. They're larger and paler south of the Mexican border, but still if a normal, classic, standard, typical savanna sparrow appears in the same habitat, it stands out in its paleness and neat light markings above and below. The large-billed sparrow was considered a distinct species by the AOU until the 1970s. And now, once again, most taxonomic authorities, but not the AOS, recognize it at the species level. The range of this chunky, big-headed, thick-billed bird was a mystery for more than 60 years after it was discovered. It was known as a sometimes abundant winterer in Southern California, but the search for the northerly breeding grounds bore no fruit until Joseph Grinnell suggested a different approach. Maybe, he said, the large-billed sparrow breeds south of California and migrates north for the winter. Grinnell thought that this sounded absurd, but he turned out to be right. The pale northern subspecies of the large-billed sparrow seen here breeds in the delta of the Colorado River and on the eastern shores of the Sea of Cortez. Then it moves north and south and west as early as July into coastal California, Baja, and Sinaloa. It seems less like a migration than it is an explosion. Risky as it is to say of any sparrow, the large build is almost unmistakable. A cold, medium pale brown with blurry streaks below, a relatively plain back, and a big curved lark-like bill. There is a darker and less dispersive subspecies of large billed sparrow in the southernmost reach of its range. It too is unmistakable in the field. I've left the fox sparrows for last. The largest of the streaked sparrows in the US and Canada, these rotund, broad-tailed, coarsely marked dwellers of shady thickets should pose no real identification challenges. Nothing looks like a fox sparrow. But what kind of fox sparrow? The fox sparrows are not especially closely related to the other streaked sparrows. In fact, their closest affinities are with the American tree sparrow. Like the savanna sparrows, the fox sparrows are currently listed by the AOS as a single highly variable species, but birders suspect and genetic studies seem to bear out that the fox sparrow is actually four different birds. Differing so much across their vast collective range in vocalizations, plumage, and bill size that they merit treatment as four distinct species. The traditional default among these birds is the red fox sparrow a real beauty, full-breasted, large-headed, and colorful. It breeds virtually across the boreal forest of North America from Western Alaska to the Canadian Maritimes. The red fox sparrow displays its own geographic variation. They're gradually paler and grayer as one moves west through the breeding range. But whatever regional population they represent, red fox sparrows are always striking and readily identifiable with rich rufous tail, shoulders, back stripes, and head markings. The white underparts are coarsely and irregularly dappled with short streaks and chevrons, densest at the center and sides of the breast, where they sometimes form quite striking foxy red patches, contrasting with the extensive cool gray of the head. The markings below are largest on the breast and upper flanks, usually finer on the lower flanks, where in some birds, they almost disappear. The greater wing coverts, and in some birds, the median coverts are raggedly tipped yellowish brown to white, forming one or two wing bars. The bill is distinctively thick-based and thin-tipped, sometimes creating the impression that the bird is, as it were, drawing in its cheeks and pursing its lips. The fox sparrows of the interior west and the southerly Pacific coasts are startlingly different. The slate-colored fox sparrow is a fairly common breeding bird from southernmost British Columbia through the Great Basin and Rockies, south to central California, Utah, and Colorado. Slate-colored share the large size and rusty tail of the red fox sparrow, but their backs and heads are almost unmarked. They're an elegant, smooth, deep gray relieved only by a narrow white eye ring in a vague and variable whitish spot on the lore. The underpart streaking tends more to brown and black than red. 
And those streaks often line up into a quite regular and uniform set of parallel stripes without the patches and blotches and flank patches of the red fox sparrow. The bill to my eye is slightly smaller and shorter than that of the average red fox sparrow. Now there are flies in the ointment. Red and slate colored fox sparrows appear to intergrade in the northern reaches of Canada's western provinces, producing birds that are intermediate in color and striking and streaking and birds that are readily assignable to neither species. My favorite fox sparrow, inevitably, is the one I've seen fewest of, the thick-billed fox sparrow. This is a variable bird in plumage, but a frequently encountered pattern combines an unmarked head and back, like a slate-colored fox sparrow, with a pale wing bar, like the red fox sparrow, and heavily blotched underparts, like a sooty fox sparrow. But the most salient character is that bill. Very heavy billed birds like this are found from Baja California north to Inyo County or so in California, while the thick builds breeding north of there into Oregon and even into southernmost Washington are less extreme, but still usually distinctive. The most widespread of these special western fox sparrows is the familiar sooty fox. This is one of the first birds that the visiting birder encounters in coastal areas from the eastern Aleutians south to Washington, in winter south as far as northern Baja. While the other fox sparrows are melancholy birds of shady woodland, sooties are happy at any season in beachside thickets and blackberry tangles in city parks. In spite of their English name, they vary geographically and individually from deep chocolate brown to dark gray to bright rusty above. That same color usually forms an extensive solid patch on the rear flanks, a mark that I often see first in the field. The streaks of the underparts are mixed with coarse chevrons, and while they may not always coalesce into a central spot, they do cluster densely on the side of the breast, just ahead of the bend of the folded wing. In most sooty fox sparrows, those markings form a heavy, almost solid shield or apron across the upper breast. There's no good answer to the question, what is a species? There's no good answer even to the question, do species exist? For the scientist in the lab and for the birder in the field, the streak-breasted sparrows of North America are an invitation to ponder both of those questions. The birds we know officially as the song, fox, and savanna sparrows brown, streaky, blobbish though they may be, all those birds open a window into the way that we think about birds in the 21st century, whatever we choose to call them. Wonderful, thank you, Rick, for that excellent presentation. The amount of detail is superb. So now I would like to ask the audience um, for questions. Go ahead and send them in in your question chat box at the bottom. Rick, do you see any uh, sparrows outside of your window today? <laughs> yes, I see slate colored juncos and I see chocolate song sparrows and I see white throated sparrows. Um, that seems to be it at the moment. Um, house sparrows, of course, but um, you know, I'm a I'm a sparrow snob, and because house sparrows aren't aren't a member of the family of New World sparrows, I I tend to overlook them. Uh, Karen says fantastic. Barb says many thanks. Well, thanks to both of you. Uh, Sue Ann asks, are the Chuck notes of the four fox sparrows similar? Uh, the chestnut tones in the four fox sparrows do tend to be pretty similar, um, with the caveat, of course, that there is a, a pretty wide range of browns, especially in sooty fox sparrows, which can be quite, quite rusty red and can also be a sort of deep chocolatey brown. Um, the brightest of the, the reds in the fox sparrows is in the tail of many red fox sparrows which is considerably more orange or reddish than a, than a hermit thrush's. On the whole, though, I would say that the range of reddish colors um, among those four fox sparrows is, is pretty close to identical. 
But he was able to pass on the question, um, what constitutes a species split? Um, when birders talk about splits and lumps, what we talk about is combining or dividing different kinds of birds into or out of species. Um, the table that I showed near the end of my remarks showed the current um, American Ornithological Society's North American Checklist Committee's um, species concept of these streak sparrows. And you noticed, for example, that the AOS recognizes the savanna sparrow. A split would split that savanna sparrow as I was essentially advocating, um, would split the savanna sparrow then into a number of different species. A lump would be, for example, um, if, if we look at earlier conceptions of the juncos as five or six or seven species, and decided suddenly, as we did in 1973, that they were all a single species. That would be a species lump. So splits and lumps um, are, are, are combining and decombining um, bird species and, and species of other organisms. What's really interesting about the two terms, splits and lumps, is that we know where it came from. Um, it seems to have been coined by Charles Darwin. Who, um, who, who used the word in a letter, I don't remember to whom, but who used the word in a letter, the, the combination of words, um, to describe exactly the process that, that you just asked about. Um, Debbie asked, is there a sound variation among the fox sparrow? There is, um, and it has been, has been worked out quite well. Um, the first important investigation was conducted by John Dunn and Kimball Garrett into the chip notes of the fox sparrows. And it was, was discovered, and, and they demonstrated this quite well. I think the paper was published in Birding um, 20, 25 years ago. Um, there are differences in the chip notes, especially between the thick build and the other fox sparrows. The songs. Um, are quite variable in fox sparrows of any population of any species, but there are consistent differences there too. Um, unfortunately, these old ears of mine don't, don't hear it as they used to. But if you go to a website such as Zeno Canto, um, X-E-N-O Canto, or to um, um, the Cornell Labs Birds of the World, you can hear recordings of all the different kinds of fox sparrows, all the different types, all the different species of fox sparrow. And I think you'll find that, yes, there are, there are some distinct um, distinctions in them vocally. Great. Well, I'd like to uh, take a minute to let everybody know of our upcoming webinar in two weeks. It is Southern Portugal in Autumn. Overlooked by many a traveler, Portugal is a beautiful country rich in art, architecture, food, and landscapes. Home to a varied and remarkable bird life, Portugal also happens to be one of Europe's top countries for birding. Please join Portugal native and birding guide extraordinaire Joao Jara for an intimate look at the country's southern half, where outstanding birding and historical highlights are themes of Vent Southern Portugal in Autumn, Birds and History Tour. Marcia says, yet another great presentation on sparrows. Thanks again for doing this. Thank you, Martha. Uh, Stan and Lori asked, are there only Ipswich sparrows wintering on the upper northeast coast, or are there also other savanna sparrows there? Yeah, um, the northeast coast in winter gets two kinds of savanna sparrows. We have the, the classic savanna sparrow in, in rather small numbers um, in, in most places. They're, they're more common as you go farther south on the coast. And then, of course, we also have the Ipswich sparrow, which winters from at least the Boston area south to the um, to the southern tip of the Delmarva Peninsula. The range of the Ipswich sparrow sounds like it's vast, um, given that it, it covers so much latitude, but it's also only a couple of hundred yards wide. Um, Ipswich sparrows are close to never 
encountered away from the dune grass on the on the Atlantic on the Atlantic beaches. So this is a bird um, quite apart from the fact that it breeds only on a single small island in Nova Scotia. This is a bird whose winter range is also extremely narrow. And um, I'm always very grateful when I get to when I get out into that that strip of coastal dune and get to see some nice Ipswich sparrows in the winter time. Adele asks, can you say more about cultural influences on ornithology? <laughs> um, yeah, that's a that's a really good question and a big question. Um, the um, the the little part, the the short comments that I made about regional and and gender bias in the history of American birding and American ornithology is something that I'm working on a little bit right now. And in fact, I'll be presenting some of the the first fruits of that investigation um, mid-February to the Washington Crossing Audubon Society in Princeton. Um, the, the overarching point here is that birding is a human activity. Um, it is not the case that the human animal birds instinctively or naturally or inevitably. Instead, birding is an activity like all cultural activities that involves a series of choices, a series of decisions, a series of alternatives. Um, one thing that I have been discovering as I think about these, these questions, and I've spent a fair bit of time over the years um, trying to think about these questions in sensible ways. But one thing that I've discovered is that the focus on identification, which of course is almost entirely what we talked about this afternoon, the focus on identification is a choice that North American birding made 120 years ago. If you look at the work especially of female birders and ornithological authors, in the second half of the 19th century, birding was a very different occupation. Um, birding was more about what we might today call ecology. It was more about what we might call behavior. Um, it also had a very strong aesthetic component. But about the turn of the 20th century, that is to say from about 1900 to about 1915, 1920, um, I suspect that I suspect that what happened is that a number of men who were interested in birds decided that birding should no longer be quite so feminine, that birding should be more masculine, um, more, more he-man, as it were. And one of the ways that they did that was to change it from these soft activities, you know, looking at nesting behavior, looking at how how lovely the birds are describing life histories they turned it into something that was measurable something that was quantifiable and if you want to do something quantifiable about birds especially in the days before before the advent of biochemistry um, identification was what it was and so the change from a soft feminine or feminized ecological birding at the end of the 19th century to a hard, masculinized, quantifiable, scientific style of birding early in the 20th century is a change that we, we still, that we still um, feel the effects of today. Um, that was a, a sort of vague answer, um, but it is, it is an important question and it's one that I like to think about. Florian has a question here. Uh, what is the difference genetically between a species and a subspecies? A certain number of mutations, specific mutations in a specific region? Um, it depends on where you decide to draw the lines. Um, typically, decisions like that, and I'm not a, a geneticist or a scientist of any kind, but as I understand the technical literature, typically what happens is someone decides that there needs to be a certain percentage of divergence in certain genetic materials between two birds. And once you have reached that quantifiable, um, that, that quantifiable threshold, then you consider them different species. Um, genetic work on, on exactly how one should define a subspecies seems to me to have been conducted less thoroughly, less enthusiastically. 
And the reason is, I think, pretty obvious. Um, subspecies just are not of the same, the same interest um, to, to many people, scientifically or in terms of conservation. But what it comes down to is, is where you draw the line. Um, if you take a very liberal lumpers view, then of course all of these all of these savanna sparrows are a single species. If you take a rather more refined, rather narrower splitters view, then you could even split the the two populations of large billed sparrows, the large billed savanna sparrows of um, of northern Mexico. You could split those into two species too. The important, the important thing to remember here is that there probably, no, not probably, there is no such thing as a species. That is a category, a human created concept that we use to make it possible to think about things. Sanford has a question. How do you record the sparrow, sparrow variations in eBird? Ah. Um, that's a that's a very good question. Um, eBird does allow you to distinguish the various savanna sparrow types and the various fox sparrow types. Um, it is possible not only to identify them to to group or to um, or to, to subspecies group, but in some cases eBird will actually offer you the option of recording the precise subspecies. The song sparrows, I would have to look and see what they do with the song sparrows. Um, I, I honestly can't answer the question about the song sparrows, but the way to find out um, the answer to questions like this is in any eBird checklist, a mock checklist, just open up a fake checklist and go to add species and type in, for example, song sparrow, and you'll get a drop down menu showing you all of the options that they have for entering song sparrows into, into your list. Fox sparrow, the same thing. You open um, the, the drop down list for fox sparrow, and you will see fox sparrow sooty, fox sparrow slate colored, fox sparrow red, fox, um, fox sparrow thick build. Peggy has a question. Uh, why does size increase in song sparrow subspecies from east to west and not west to east? Um, I'm not certain that size does increase um, with longitude. Size certainly increases with latitude. And this is a very, um, very well observed and, and well codified rule, as it were, in zoogeography that animals living in colder climates in our hemisphere, more northerly climates, are larger than animals living in warmer in our hemisphere, more southerly, southerly climates. Um, and so we get we get song sparrows that are every bit as big as as the biggest fox sparrows in Alaska, while the song sparrows of Southern California and Arizona, and I believe the um, the disjunct populations of song sparrows in Mexico are significantly smaller. So I think that what we're looking at here is more a matter of north-south rather than east-west. Well, it looks like we have time for a few more questions from the audience. Adele asks, how do you think the increasing participation, the increasingly I'm sorry, increasing participation of women will influence the future of ornithology. I don't know what it will do with ornithology. Um, a great many very distinguished ornithologists nowadays are women. Um, 75 years ago, it was, it was notable. Um, I, I could have named the important female ornithologists on one hand. Nowadays, there are lots of, of very accomplished um, very thoughtful, very successful female ornithologists. How it will change birding is something that I might be a little more qualified to talk about. Um, and I think that what will happen is that the focus on identification will once again blur a bit. And we may well start looking at birds in a more, a more general, a more comprehensive, a more holistic way than we have. Um, there was a very interesting interview published, this must have been the early 80s, late 70s, 
um, in Birding Magazine by the um, California birder Terry Clark, who talked about this sort of thing a while. She was um, she was working in a birding culture that was overwhelmingly male, overwhelmingly focused on identification and on um, on on quantification of the birding experience. And she had some interesting comments, um, some interesting predictions about the possibility that birding might return in some ways to what it was in the 1870s and 1880s. Um, the, the type of birding, the more holistic type of birding that we culturally, historically rejected um, in, the, in the early 20th century. So it is certainly going to be an interesting development and one that I, I wish I could hang around another 50 or 60 years to see myself. Uh, Joe says, thank you, Rick. I saw seven red fox sparrows today in Maryland. Uh, you're lucky. I haven't seen one for a few days, and I miss them. I miss them. That's, that's a great sighting. And uh, we have time. We'll take one more question before we end our broadcast for today. Um, Joan asked, are species designations based on DNA? Um, very often. Very often that is the way that, that determinations of what should be and should not be accounted as species. Um, that is very often the way that, that those determinations are made by measuring the differences in genetic material between one group of organisms and another group of organisms. Yes. Well, I would like to thank everybody in the audience today for uh, their participation and in their questions. If there was any questions I didn't answer, please email me, ben at ventbird.com and I'll do my best to get those uh, answers over to you as soon as possible. We would like to thank our presenter, Rick Wright, today for a wonderful presentation. Thank you, Ben. It was fun to be here. And uh, we hope to see everyone in two weeks. Until then, have a great day. Bye, everyone.